I just heard about this subreddit today and I have a story that I think fits really well here. Years ago, I was home from university and was spending the evening with my girlfriend. We were feeling a little frisky, but since we were home from college at our parents' houses, we decided to go for a little drive. Our hometown was fairly rural, so it didn't take much time for us to drive out somewhere on a country road near an alfalfa field where we could have some privacy. Hardly anyone drove past here, maybe one truck every hour or so. So the engine is off, the lights are off, and our seats are reclined. My car was small, so there wasn't any room to get in the back and really go at it. But tenderness is tenderness, whether there's a stick shift between you or not. But that night, I'm glad I had to stay in the driver's seat. Just as things began to get real heated, I see some headlights in the rearview mirror coming up the road. That's not a big deal, so I toned down the action a bit waiting for it to pass, but as the truck got closer, its headlights suddenly went dark. My girlfriend wasn't totally aware of it yet, but I pulled away a bit out of curiosity. Then I heard the coasting, gravelly crunch of a vehicle pulling off onto the gravel behind us. It was dark there, no street lights or anything to go by, but with the moon there was. I could barely make out the outline of a truck behind us. No cab lights, no running engine. I asked my girlfriend if her door was locked. This stopped her dead in her tracks. She said it was and asked why. I told her there was someone behind us, parked in the gravel. She immediately straightened herself up and I put my seat back up, never taking my eyes off the mirror. Then I saw the driver's side door to the truck open. The cab light still didn't turn on, and I never saw anyone get out, but that was my sign to get out of there. I told my girlfriend we needed to leave now, which she real quietly replied okay to. I started up the vehicle, and trying my best not to spin out in the gravel, drove as fast as I could onto the road. We drove in silence for about two minutes, heading back towards town, when I noticed that I could not see the sky clearly behind the vehicle. We were being followed. The truck still did not turn on its headlights, but it was tailgating me very closely. I calmly informed my girlfriend that they were behind us, but that we had plenty of gas and we get back to town just fine, no big deal. She said okay, in that little voice again and went silent, glancing back every so often. This continued for about two minutes, and I briefly considered calling the police before the headlights behind me flared on. The truck revved its engine pulled into the other lane, we were still on a two-lane asphalt country road, and hauled past me like a bat out of hell. I felt like I should take her home at this point, but the last thing I wanted was for those assholes to follow us to where she lived. Whoever they were, they made me uneasy. I told her as much, and she agreed. We wove a flighty path through several nice neighborhoods, before pulling into a cul-de-sac where we could sit and wait to see if the truck was still around. We never saw the truck again that night, but our cul-de-sac time did give us the opportunity to have the intimate time we had been wanting, all the more intense due to constantly watching to make sure we were safe. Looking back, I'm sure it was some country farm people who were used to catching kids making out near their fields. They probably wanted to bang on our windows and give us a good scare for fun. But I have to wonder why they followed us for so long, and why they passed us the way they did. Were they out for a joyride, looking for some entertainment? Creepy farm truck person or people? Let's not meet. You give me the heebie-jeebies. I work as a camp counselor in the summer. It's a fun job, and all my coworkers are great people. It's an all-around fantastic place to be. We get days off here and there. And this particular night, myself and a few other counselors had been given time off from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. the next night. We were all ecstatic, seeing as this week had been a particularly stressful one. We had decided to take a group trip to the nearest Target to get more food to stash in the staff lounge and whatever other things we needed. After our goodbyes to our fellow counselors who did not have off, we all got in the car and left. While browsing, I noticed a man probably in his early 50s, near us in the snack aisle. 
I am definitely a paranoid person. I'm always thinking someone is going to try something with me or one of my friends. So I tried to ignore him, though it really seemed like every time we moved over, he took a step over with us. When we switched to the next aisle, we were alone for about a minute until the man moved to the same aisle. I didn't say anything to my friends, thinking maybe he was just going through the store in order to get something. When we were done in the food section of the store, we decided to get more sunscreen before we forgot, which is on the other side of the store. We picked out what we needed, and when we turned to leave the aisle, there was the man, looking right at us. We hurried past him, and I immediately tell my friends that he's been following us since we came in, to which one of my female friends agreed, saying she'd been watching him from the beginning as well. We decided to go into the feminine hygiene aisle, knowing that if he showed up, we would be sure that he was following us. He did. One of my male friends had had enough of this weirdo and turned to face him and said, Dude, what? In a pretty assertive voice. We thought this would make him scamper off, but what happened instead just made us even more uneasy. The unkempt greasy man let out a grunt, followed by some mouth breathing, before looking up the friend who had spoken and muttered, not you. We were all thoroughly creeped out and decided it was time to go. We checked out and started out to the parking lot with our bags when the store alarm went off, meaning there was a security tag still on something we bought. My friend offered to take it back while we load up the car so we can get back to camp, all of us just wanting to relax. I ended up going back in with her, not wanting to walk out there with them if the guy was out there waiting. We got the security tag removed and headed out. Immediately after stepping out the door, my friend almost ran smack into the creep. She slipped past him and fast walked, me in tow. The rest of our friends saw this and started driving up to the store so we could jump in and get out of there. Before I could step off the sidewalk to hurry to my car, the man came from behind me and grabbed my arm. I turned around to yank my arm away and I could smell his breath. It smelled rotten, like he hadn't opened his mouth in years. He moved his body closer and, accompanied with a cloud of his sickening breath, said, Want to see my big dick? To which I answered, Get your fucking hands off me. I pulled my arm away from him and threw myself into the back of the car, and we sped out of there. Let me also point out that three of the people with me were foreigners from Ireland and Australia, here with the Camp America program and this was their first time leaving the camp. Welcome to my country, friends. So, this was when I was much younger, in college. I'm sure you could find this, as it was in the news, local RI news, if you tried hunting for it. I was dating a girl that went to a school in Providence, Rhode Island. It was the summer and everyone was back home. My girlfriend's best friend had an internship back in Providence, and this girl had a four-bedroom multi-family home to herself. The other three roommates were paying for their rooms but chose to stay home. I guess they could only get this place if they started paying rent two to three months prior to the school year starting, but whatever. One weekend, my girlfriend asks me to go to Providence with her to spend some time with her friend. She is lonely and has nothing to do on the weekends. We're only like one hour from Providence, so it sounds like a plan. We head down and we just chill for the night, drink, and do some cocaine. It's about 2 a.m. and we decide to walk out and get some cigs. Nothing special. We walk by a guy on our way home from the gas station who is just staring at us. Kind of creepy, but no big deal, as it's 2 a.m. in Providence and her house wasn't located in the best of areas, but certainly not the worst. We eventually all pass out, and me and my girlfriend head home the next day. The end of the week comes and my girlfriend asks if I want to go to Providence again, but I can't as I have to work all weekend so I decline. She heads down there, and her friend's boyfriend is coming to stay over. Pretty much a repeat of the weekend before. 
They all drink, but end up going out and partying a little bit. They are walking back after a night of drinking when they enter the mudroom around 2 a.m. They close the mudroom door behind them, which was left unlocked, and there's a dude really raggedy looking in there waiting for them. He says out loud to them, Get in the fucking house. They all turn around and he has a gun. My girlfriend's friend has already unlocked the door to the house and it's partially opened. Everyone is frozen in place and the guy repeats himself, Get in the fucking house. The boyfriend then steps forward with his hands up a little bit as to not seem confrontational and says, Hey man, calm down. It's all good. I don't know how the fuck this dude was brave enough to do any of this. As he says that, the dude shoots him. My girlfriend and her friend run into the house and hide under a bed. They can't hear this, but the assailant took off and didn't follow them back in. They don't know this though and are terrified, hiding under a bed while the boyfriend is screaming for help. They think the psycho has come into the house and is looking for them. My girlfriend told me they were both silently crying under the bed while the boyfriend screamed for help. And, this is the worst part, yelling out, Help me! I'm dying! The neighbors heard the gunshot and screaming and called the police. They ended up catching the dude. He had been watching the girl for weeks. It was the guy we had seen watching us the week prior. Worst part was, the girl's boyfriend ended up dying. This story takes place in August of 2013 in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I'm a U.S. Air Force Security Forces Airman, military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn to thunderstorms, my buddy Nick, another military cop, and I decided to explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days off, starting on roads that we knew, finding roads that we didn't, and driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road we had never been on and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in the thick fir woods and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5'5". Five five. Regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small, one-man tent was set in the back of the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread and felt certain that there was someone in the tent, and if we could see the tent, then they could see us. There were no campgrounds in the area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely, someone camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, 
As we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming from it. Nick suggested I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area, but we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp. Should we need to leave in a hurry, he would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees toward the tent. I was totally keyed up and my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, no wood collected. The tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen. As I left, I heard Nick start yelling. Let's go. Let's get the fuck out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat-up old Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat, and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way we had come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still do not know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police, and they promised to send a trooper out to check out the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper, stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the women's clothing were all gone though we could tell people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to the area, and do not intend to. So when my dad was roughly nine or so, him and a couple of his cousins, the oldest thirteen, were hanging out at a park in Massachusetts. It was summer and a hot day, and the year was 1968, I believe. As he and his cousins were trying to avoid the heat, a man meets them and introduces himself as Stanley Rice, a nice enough looking guy with a camera bag. They strike up a conversation and the heat comes up. Stanley mentions an old swimming hole he knows in a creek a little ways out of town and offers to show them the way. Being naive children in the less suspicious 60s, they agree and set out for the creek. They walk and walk and walk, cross the train tracks a mile out of town, and walk another 20 minutes until the oldest cousin rejoins the group of kids. For the majority of the trip, the oldest had been walking with Stanley and talking to him. As he saunters back to the group, still lazily following Stanley, he whispers to my dad, that bag has a totally different name on it, and he's got a pistol. As this happens, they reach the swimming hole. They plan to break for it when Stanley gets in the water. Strangely enough, Stanley is already wearing swimming trunks as he strips his pants. He tells the boys to come on and join him as he dives in the water. They scatter and begin running as fast as they can back home. Having watched too many army shows, they start zigzagging back and forth as they hear Stanley cling out and grab the pistol. My dad looked back as the last thing he saw was Stanley Rice on one knee with a Luger pistol pointed at him, yelling his head off. So they all escaped and none of them told their parents. Six months later, Stanley Rice was arrested. Turns out he was an escaped mental patient whose M.O. was raping little boys and burying them in the sand of creek beds. Apparently when they caught him, he had already killed more than 10 and had two kids captive bound in a van. So, that's one of the near-death stories my dad has in which I almost wasn't born.
Now, I don't know if this will sound scary through writing, but it definitely was if you were there. So, a few years back, I was cruising around with my brother, cousin, and a few friends. We decided to go down this creepy back road. We got to the end of it, and there was a trail that continued off of it. We decided to get out and walk the trail, even though it was pitch black out. We didn't really have a good feeling about the place, but we pressed on anyways. Now, let me say that if anyone else had come down the road, we would have seen their headlights in the woods. So after walking for a little bit, we all went back to the cars. My friend, Alex, stopped and said, What's that noise? We all stopped talking and heard a hissing noise. His tires on his car had been slashed. We all panicked, because nobody else would be at this dead-end back road in the middle of nowhere this late at night. So we got in the cars and took off. Not too far down the road, his car was undrivable, and we had to squeeze him in our Jeep. We went to a gas station to get some snacks, and when we came out, the Jeep tires were slashed too. I don't know how that could have happened, so it seems like someone had followed us and slashed our tires. So, creepy forest dwelling tire slasher, let's not ever meet. This happened several summers ago, when I was working at a summer day camp and living with my grandfather during the week. He was much closer to the camp than my parents. Where he lived was a somewhat small neighborhood and somewhat rural. I describe it as also being middle to upper middle class, and that most people there knew each other, by sight at least. I have a beard, and I've been told I look intimidating sometimes. The car I had at the time was oldish, and maybe stood out a bit by being oldish in this neighborhood. It was a day just like any other. I drove back to my grandpa's from work. I was gross and sweaty, and wanted to take a shower and eat dinner. I was wearing my camp shirt and a bandana. The route back was some country roads and a highway. Most of the way it was one lane, but there were multiple lights where it'd be two lanes approaching the light and a little ways after and then back to one lane. It was about a half hour, 20-ish mile drive. I get back to my grandpa's development and I notice a car is pulled off behind me. That's a little weird, but whatever. It turns down the street behind me and is going really slowly. This is weird because it's not the car of any of his neighbors that I can recognize and I get this weird feeling. I can't see who's driving but it's a big SUV. My crappy old car was a sedan and they're kissing my bumper. I figure maybe I cut this person off and they're pissed. I decide not to go right back to grandpa's because I don't want some crazy person at his house. So, not knowing where the police station is, and not really feeling threatened, I do a few laps around the neighborhood, driving in circles, to make it very obvious I know this person is following me. Finally, on a turn, I'm able to see who it is following me. It's some 40-ish looking lady who doesn't appear to be very large. I figure, what the fuck? and I pull over in a cul-de-sac a block or two from my grandpa's. This lady starts pulling up, and I start to roll down the window to see what the hell she wants. She starts yelling at me that she's calling the cops. What? Why? Apparently, for most of the way back from camp, I was behind her. These are pretty busy roads, and so I must have been following her. I must be in a gang because I'm wearing a bandana. The funny thing is, it's brownish, tannish, not red, blue, or yellow. I passed her coming out of the last light before my grandpa's house. Now she's calling the cops with my plate number, etc. And they're apparently going to take me to jail because I'm a scumbag. I start laughing. Probably not the correct response. But after a long day in the sun, putting up with 12-year-olds, my brain was fried. If I was following her, then why the hell would I pass her? Then she demands to know where I'm going. All of this in between her talking to the cops on the phone. I tell her hell no, that it's none of her business where I'm going. She starts freaking out, so I get back in the car, and she starts pounding on the windows. 
for camp. We had to program the police non-emergency number into our phones just in case. I don't know in case of what, but I was a good staff member and did. So I call the police and I tell them what's going on. Apparently, the guy on the other end was sitting adjacent to whoever was talking to Crazy Lady and said they'd sent a cruiser out already to see what was up. Not much to do in this town and it'd be there in a few minutes. I explain to the guy what's going on and we have a good chuckle about it. He says he'll tell the police who are on their way. Police car shows up a few minutes later and having already been informed of what's going on, they tell this lady to get away from me and let me go on my merry way. She's freaking out that they're letting me get away and that at this point, they're physically restraining her. I drive off and don't think much of it. I eat dinner, shower, etc. If only this were the end. A few days later, I notice a familiar looking SUV out front of my grandpa's before I leave for work. As I come out the door, it pulls away really quick, but it was obviously this lady. Smart me. I took a picture before she pulled away, holding the day's paper in it to show that it was definitely taken after the initial incident. I called the police told them and they said they'd check up on it. I got a call that afternoon saying that they had a talking to with this lady and she thought she had a right to know where I lived. I was a bit worried about anyone hanging around my grandpa's as he's old and would be easy to take advantage of or rob and I just didn't want some crazy bitch hanging around. The cops told me that they told her that if they ever saw her near there again that I'd have a case to get a restraining order and that they'd help me do it and charge her with stalking and intimidation or something. They actually sent a police car by a few times after this, but I never saw her again. I still wonder why the fuck you would turn off once it became apparent that someone wasn't actually following you and you follow them. That makes no sense. <laughs>